my name is Emily Moorhead and I'm a kindergarten teacher in the Limestone Board. I've been teaching kindergarten for almost all of my career. Every now and then I pop up to grade one just to remember what they need to know and who they need to be by the time they get there. And then I come back down and get back settled in in kindergarten again. Um, kindergarten is where my heart is. So it's, it's comfy and fun and happy for me, even though there is an element of sort of chaos, controlled chaos and madness there. But that's just part of our day-to-day -day lives at school. Um, I really got really involved in this work fairly early on when my own child was really struggling um, to learn how to read. And we got really lucky because the reading clinic in Kingston supported him and supported me in my learning so that I could take what I had learned from helping my own child and bring it to my classroom every day. And I have been just floored by the way that my students have responded and the way they they have approached learning how to read ever since then so that's been that's been big and then in the last few years i've been also involved in helping to now teach that teaching course in the summertime um, so jennifer harrison and i have been doing that and the reading clinic is now owned by the boys and girls club and so it's it's been a great sort of collaboration with them too to be sure that we're reaching as many kids as we can so and and now as many teachers as we can too so it's been it's been really exciting and really neat to see this change start to happen um, in our teachers and in our schools um i have to say i i think like this is this is a, a big part of what i do every day at school but it is not the whole picture and in kindergarten we're an entirely play-based program we have lots of inquiry happening all the time and and our kids are, are learning to read nicely in a in a playful and fun kind of way, but it is certainly not sort of teacher driven all the time. This little piece is quite teacher driven, but I'm really watching to make sure that what I'm doing with my kids is developmentally appropriate for them. And I'm catching the ones who look like they're ready to take off and also making sure that the ones who look like they are struggling a bit to hang on and keep up with with that instruction are getting enough support to make sure that they are able to be successful too so it really is a program that is able to work for every single kid in my classroom every day so that's pretty that's pretty fun and um sort of that balance with the inquiry pieces the fact is no child is going to sit around and think hmm I wonder what sounds TH could say. They they just they just don't know to think that. And and even as as readers and writers, we don't necessarily know to offer that to kids. And that's the piece that that comes from this direct instruction and this really really systematic approach. And then as as we start to draw children's attention to the fact that the language is made up of all these little pieces and it's quite intriguing and fun and interesting they start to wonder and ask questions on their own and and it takes off from there so it sort of links into that inquiry once we've taught their brains how to do that and what to ask about and what to wonder so that's been that's been sort of especially in the last couple of years that's been that's been the key for me is that i was always sort of trying to find that balance with the play and find the balance with the inquiry kind of model without losing that teacher directed really structured instruction and explicit instruction because i i want my kids to be successful and english is a complex language to learn it takes a long time there are a lot of pieces and leaving our kids into grade one into grade two is is a long time to wait when there are so many pieces to learn and we, we want them to be successful we want them to feel great about themselves and we want them to feel like they are good learners and they they know how to learn and they can be successful at school and and all of the pieces need to come in together and certainly last night at the hearing it was it was overwhelming the sort of social impact of struggling with learning to read children very quickly discover that they're, they're not reading the same way other kids are, even in kindergarten and in grade one. They, they already can see that there's a, a gap there and that becomes a social gap too. The French immersion population were, were saying that they were encouraged to move out of French immersion and into English. And the, even the social dynamic that that created was, was really difficult for their children. And it was, it was pretty powerful to hear those stories. So I'm hoping from these webinars that I can help people to understand that there are little pieces that we can do in our classrooms every day that really help give every child a good sound start and let them get moving. And we can identify really early the kids who are more likely to struggle so that we can nudge them along and support them a little more and get them going.
So in this webinar tonight, we'll be talking about phonological awareness and also linking that to print. And so that's, that's a big leap for a lot of kids. There are some children who come into kindergarten really knowing about letters and words and sounds and other children who have never even heard of letters before and everybody in between. So that's sort of our focus for tonight. Um, the next webinar will be more about sort of reading and spelling and using blending and segmenting um, effectively in our classrooms and then the last one we'll talk more about supporting every learner, making sure that we are using all the means that we have available to us in our classrooms and also using whole group instruction and small group instruction and occasionally one-on-one -on -one instruction to really make sure we're giving kids the very best chance to be successful in reading. So tonight we'll dig into phonological awareness and um, we're especially paying attention to the pieces that are often sort of neglected or forgotten or sort of underemphasized, and sometimes those are the really tough ones. So they they need us to make sure that we're emphasizing them a little more. We seem to do quite well with some of the easy skills or the ones that are easy for us to quickly teach, but not so well with some of the ones that are much harder for us to teach and harder for us and harder for us to sort of work on with kids and maybe just harder for us to even pull words from our minds. But but I think as teachers, if we if we know what we're what we're trying to get from those pieces, we can start to build that in a little more. We're really going to help ourselves tune into the errors and listening to listen to the errors that children are making so that we can really be diagnostic and we can target the kinds of words we're giving kids and the kinds of skills we're asking kids to work on and make sure that we're really building from the bottom up and making sure that they've got those foundational skills so that they can be then successful readers. And we'll really, um, we'll really think about strategies that help us to introduce letters and sounds so that they connect with those phonological skills and we can build that. Once we've already been working on those phonological skills, we can build that sense of how print fits into that and we'll be able to support kids as they learn the letters and sounds too. So phonological awareness, if you're wondering, is the ability to hear the small sounds in our language. So we want children to be able to attend to those sounds. We want them to discriminate them, so one from another, and hear them. And we want them to remember the bits so that they can manipulate them. And so those are, those are four big skills and they come on relatively in, in a continuum that's fairly, um, sorry. Uh, sorry, I've totally lost my train of thought, but it'll come right back. Um, they, they, they tend to come on fairly consistently. We can, we can expect which one will follow one behind the next. And so that's a way that we can already be prepared to help students. The very sort of ideal goal at the end of all this phonological work is that phonemic awareness. That's being able to use those sounds at an individual phoneme level. Those are the tiniest sounds in our English language or in our spoken language. And so they often are represented by single letters, but sometimes they're Com com combinations of letters too that make those sounds. The neat thing about phonological awareness tasks is that we can practice them with our eyes closed, we can practice them in the dark, we don't need any extra materials with us at all. We often will play with our kids when we're lined up before we go to the gym or when we're on our way in from recess when it's just quick and we can just throw them a word and they can practice using those skills because they don't they don't need to see anything. It's all about what they're hearing with their ears and the sounds they're producing with their mouth fun to play with our eyes closed just for something to do. Um, phonological awareness begins to develop in infancy and our children often generally will come to us at school already moving along that continuum quite nicely. Um, they're able generally when they come to kindergarten to discriminate individual words in the sentences and the language that's swirling around them. So if I were to say to a child, go put your mittens on the heater, they can hear what it is they're supposed to put on the heater and where it is they're supposed to put those mittens because each of those words can be heard and peeled apart into single little bits. As they start to progress, we also want them to work on hearing syllables and rhyming words and beginning sounds and then final sounds and middle sounds in words too. So they're getting finer and finer and the pieces that they're able to work from are, are smaller. Those get harder as we go. That predictable continuum can help us to make choices about what we're asking kids to do. And also it means that we can really target 
even within a whole group kind of instructional time, we can target children who are further along the continuum and children who have not moved as far along that continuum so that we can make sure that little Johnny over here gets to use little words that have tiny sounds in them, like tell me the sounds that you hear in the word cup, and little Elliot over here is listening for how many syllables are in the word panther, and he can use those bigger chunks and be able to hear them. So that's, that's sort of an interesting thing that we can, we can do as teachers so that even when we're working with a whole class, we can, we can target within that some little pieces. Um, in your handout, I've you given you a copy of that continuum so that you can sort of get a sense of that. And it's important to think about those bits as sort of the big chunks and we're working our way toward the tiny little pieces in our language. It's really helpful for teachers to be aware of that continuum and, and keep it in your back of your mind all the time and also understand that even within the, the big picture, we can also skim some littler pieces off of there so that we can help kids who are struggling. We can find a way to sort of split even smaller those, those, those leaps from one to the next so that we can make sure we're able to help every kid. Um, the goal always to be sure is to keep those kids in our classes in that sort of comfortable struggle zone. So we want them to have to listen and to have to think and have to try and we don't, but we don't want them to have to fail. So we, we want to sort of support them in a way that means that they're working at a, at a exactly comfortable targets sort of skill and then we can start to move them along and stretch them out as we go. Oh, one more thing about that. <laughs> Furthermore, we also, I think it's important as teachers, we can, we can use yeah, like even just like a mental note, but we can, we can take what we see and what we hear from our kids and just kind of remember who was where and what was hard so that we can already start to peel off some diagnostics there so that we can decide if we notice that somebody isn't really progressing in the same way and, and give them a little extra practice, a little more support, a little more movement, a little more activity, a little more concrete kind of structure things that we can use little blocks to help us represent those pieces or we can use more movement like jumping or clapping to help them feel those sounds a little bit more deeply and and it's really it's really helpful because those guys are, are likely to be our strugglers and it, it's great to notice them early and be able to start to support them even before we start to add print to the picture. We have opportunities in our classrooms every single day to build our kids phonological awareness skills these take no time at all and they're a great little transitional time thing. So I often will use my phonological awareness activities in little moments when we're lining up at the door or when I'm walking along down the hall with one child, you know, going to pick up something from the office or going to get ice. They're great opportunities to say, oh, what, what do you think? Do the words sun and bun rhyme with each other? And, and it's, a, it's a nice time to be able to sort of build those skills. They're interactive and fun. They take no time. So even as we're waiting, sitting in our classroom, waiting for the rest of the kids to come in and get settled on the carpet, the kids who are there can be playing these little phonological games that are building their brains and building their skills in a way that's quite helpful for them. It's fun for them. And it uses that time without the accidentally sort of stretching into the next thing we were hoping to do or bumping some activity or making us late for something, it sort of fits in, you know, so I can say as the kids are coming in from the yard, do cake and make rhyme, yes or no? And they can just quickly answer and keep right on going as the kids are lining up to go to the library. What words rhyme with sun? And they can call out ideas or raise their hands and quickly answer them. But those things at least help us um, to sort of fill that time in a way that's useful for kids. And it's, it's great. It means that all through my day, I can do little diagnostic tests all day long just to sort of get a sense of where we are and keep kids' brains kind of firing up. We often will have kids line up when we say, oh, line up if your name rhymes with Shara. And so Sarah jumps right up and over she goes. And then, oh, line up if your name rhymes with facts. And then Max will jump up and walk away. You could do the same thing with beginning sounds. Line up if your name starts with k. Line up if your name ends with r. And the kids then are tuning in even to their own names and making choices. And 
there's there's no consequence. It's not like if you accidentally jumped up when your name didn't end with a t sound, then it, there, anything would happen. It's just a nice a nice way to sort of tune them in and get them get them thinking and get them working. As children enter our school or classroom, even we can sort of give them some movement tasks. So we can say, let's march the word the syllables in the word Saturday, and then they can sat day and they can march those those syllables and count them out as they go let's tiptoe the the syllables in the word baby baby -be. great what's the very last sound we hear in the word fish Shh. so we can we can help them tune in to all the different bits of our language as we go they can be so fast that they actually take up almost no time in our day, but they really make a big difference for some kids and they certainly make a big difference as a teacher because you can start to catch spots that are a little weak for some kids or figure out who's ready to move on and do new things. Um, in our classrooms, I, I think, I suspect, that often what happens is that we really, really focus heavily on certain aspects of these phonological tasks. So all of us, I'm sure, can remember and someone would say, clap the syllables in the word butterfly, butterfly. And they, we can remember doing beginning sound tasks. What sound do you hear at the beginning of the word baby? But we often sort of miss some other, some other parts that are perhaps not, not being practiced enough and are sometimes really tricky for kids. So it's important to sort of catch those and remember to add them into our day. We can also tie in our phonological tasks to activities that are going on elsewhere in our classroom. So we can count the syllables in the word perimeter when we're working on math. And we can, you know, be doing an inquiry or investigation about shadows and say, oh, what sound is at the beginning of the word shadow? And we can stretch those out so kids can hear them and connect those pieces together so that our whole day is quite connected and the kids learning is involved in lots of ways in what they're doing. Two big and very important phonological tasks are reciprocal and those are blending and segmenting. They work together, they're opposites. Blending is basically taking little pieces and putting them together to make a bigger word while segmenting is snipping a bigger word into littler bits. And it's really, really important that as teachers we're giving kids the opportunity to do both of those quite regularly. They're tricky skills and they often don't get as much sort of practice as we as we would hope and they're really really essential for learning how to read. So often what happens is that we really really work on certain skills like the segmenting job which is clap the syllables in the word Saturday, clap the syllables in the word happy, march the syllables in perimeter, but we're, we're missing the flip side of that which is more like I'm going to give you a word marshmallow and I want you to snip it into its bits so sorry backwards I'm sorry excuse me back it up if if I were to say I'm going to throw you a word and I'll give you the little pieces and I want my kids to then put those pieces together so if I tell you the word stew d o in three chunks and the kids then have to think about those bits and put them together to make the word studio and that that is a skill that we don't do nearly as frequently as we do with the, the clapping bit and starting from whole words and chopping down into small bits so it's important I think for all of us to do that do that reciprocal side and to really work on giving kids the little pieces and having them put the words together to make a big one so you can imagine saying okay I'm gonna give you some pieces of a word and I want you to stick them together N vel lope and the kids then have to take those bits and put them together to make the word envelope and that's that's a much much diff more difficult skill and it's the skill that's involved specifically in in reading when we have to take those bits and put them together and we see the little pieces and stick them together so often I'll do a kind of playful game. I might start out with a ball early in the year. I might keep going with a ball with someone who's really busy or active or likes to play with a ball, but, but I can also just as easily say, oh, I'm going to throw you a word. And I'll throw maybe one hand, maybe two. And sometimes I'll make a big fuss, like, get your hands ready. Be ready. Here it comes. Get ready. Here it comes. Coffee. And the kids then catch and I'll say, oh, did you catch it? Did you get it? And they 
catch those pieces and stick them together. They can actually do that action. So catch, catch, and put them together so that those little pieces are cough, fee, and they put them together to, get, to make coffee. We can, I can do the same thing like, oh, look what's on your arm. It's a spider. What is it? And they you know, can use their fingers on their arm and put spider and snap them together to make that spider, that whole word that is maybe for some kids really, really hard to hear those bits and put them together. As we teach and play with these tasks with our students, it's really, really inevitable that some tasks will stump our little people. And, and it's important to recognize those really early on and to figure out a way that we can pull back a little and build that skill a little bit more, a, a little bit more for them. Um, with syllable counting and syllable work, we can also move to bigger chunks that are a little bigger and we can use compound words. They have more meaning and they let our kids still be successful. So if we were talking about um, use, instead of using syllables, you can imagine that the difference between the word marsh, mal, low, and the word sleep over, a little one who's still developing, being able to hear those individual syllables would have a not much, much easier time with pulling off the sleep and the over and putting them back together to make a whole word and say sleepover than they would with those littler pieces of marsh, mal, low. There isn't meaning attached to each of those little bits and so that can be hard for them. Even sometimes when we want to sort of step them into syllables, we can use compound words that are also each their own syllable like cow, boy, or drive through that help them get into those syllables, but they're also supported by a little more meaning in their words. And then we can start to move them in the direction of being able to do syllable work and then beyond. Some children will never need that in between step. They can jump right to syllables. They can jump right from syllables to phonemes and, and that works for them. For other kids, those things are really hard. A step between syllables and phonemes is to work on onsets and rhymes. So that beginning sound and then the rhyming chunk is, is another way that we can start to have the kids pull them apart. So we can say, I'm gonna throw you a word, air. What's the whole word? Fair. And so it's lots of, not a lot of meaning in that first chunk, but a good chunk of meaning in that second chunk and they can tack them together more easily than having them say, a, er. Those are harder, more pieces and less real concrete meaning to those. Always try to think about the fact that bigger chunks and fewer of them are going to be easier than smaller chunks and more of them. So if our kids are struggling, we can use shorter words, like two syllables instead of three syllables or four syllables, we can back that up a bit, or we can use big chunks like syllables. If our kids are really, really excelling, we can get into hearing individual phonemes in our words and sort of squeeze them down to little tiny words or slightly longer words. So we can have maybe a word that has a blend or two blends in it so that we can push those kids a little farther. So we can have a kid say, you know, I'm gonna tell you a word. I want you to listen for all these sounds and then put the word together. So we might say, okay, here's the word. B, U, E, N, D. What is that whole word? blend. That's a lot of sounds and they have to hold those sounds in their heads and put them back together. So make sure I think when you're working with your kids that you're also making sure that you're incorporating those little pieces and having the kids blend them back together because that's a big leap that often is missed I think when we're when we're teaching. I think we do a lot more segmenting. I'll give you the whole word, you clap the syllables, I'll give you the whole word, you march around. Those things are, are not, this, not the same skill but, and in fact they're reciprocal so we want to try to balance that out and do about the same amount of both so that we're really targeting our kids. With, when we get down into the phoneme level, it's important to recognize that the beginning sound is the easiest sound for our kids to hear. And if our kids are struggling, we can think about those sort of longer sounds, like words that start with the mm sound or the f sound or the s sound, because we can stretch them out and hold those sounds longer to help support our kids. The little t sound or p, those sounds are so short that if you blink, you will miss them. And, and 
though that can be tricky for some kids and it's they need a little more time to process those sounds so if we can use those more continuant sounds the stretchy sounds we can give kids more time to process each sound and then be able to use them more effectively and then we work our way toward those shorter sounds that are harder for them to hear because they have to hear them fast but but that's another way that we can sort of make that a little easier or a little harder for our kiddos as they start to develop mastery, it's important to kind of move them along and keep some things so that they're comfy and they feel confident and, and familiar with those sounds, but also to move them along that continuum so that we're getting closer and closer to being able to hear the phonemes. So that beginning sound is the first one they can hear. Then they jump right to the end of, say, a three sound word and they can hear the ending sound next. And that middle sound, which is often a vowel sound, can be very, very hard for their little ears to hear and it's the last one for them to start to notice. So it's important to spend some time on beginning sounds, then to move to those ending sounds and practice those ending sounds and listening. I always sort of use hand motion that's that so that I'm teaching them to hear the word, stretch across and listen for that sound that comes at the end of the word. That's the bit that they're trying to hear. And then later I'll do the same thing to help them get a sense of that listen, listen, that's the one we want. We often use our whole bodies in our kindergarten class. It's a great way for us once we, once we get into that listening for all three sounds in a word. And really in kindergarten, I think if we've got kids able to listen for three sounds and hear those three sounds and work with those three sounds, we've, we've done a really good job and our kids are, are going to be quite successful. So if I were to give the child the word soup, I would have them put the first sound on their head, the middle sound on their belly button, ooh, and the bottom sound down and touch their toes. P. Later on, once they start to be trying to work with a pencil and doing some work on print at the same time, we might switch over to arms. So we might say s, ooh, p, soup. When I'm sitting with someone who's having trouble pulling those three sounds out, my first choice is to go to two sound words for a bit. So we could do up or me, and those are shorter. So they're easier for kids to be able to put those sounds on their body and hold on to them. Some of it, it's a working memory thing too. So we're asking kids to hold those sounds in their head and think about both at the same time. But with those body movements, when I have someone who's really having a hard time, I can often give that shoulder a little squeeze or that elbow a little squeeze to help them really zero in on what sound was there. And often my little ones will sit next to me and I'll do that for a while for them. And then I'll say, okay, you put it on your arm. And some will take my hand and still put it onto their shoulder or their elbow or their wrist because they, they like that feel. And it does, it gives them a little more input there so they can really zero in on it, especially that middle sound. So it's, it's fun to sort of teach them to do that too and to find those sounds. Finally, once this starts to be cumbersome, we can move into just counting on our fingers and putting those sounds on our fingers. And in kindergarten, most of our kids can do that. Of course, it's fun to add movement. It's fun to add extra things. We can use a ball, we can bounce a ball, so we can count the syllables, but it's also important to just make sure that we're doing some phonological work every day to make sure that we're supporting these kids and supporting that development as they come. Once we've got a good sense and we're starting to hear beginning sounds and words, it's a great time to start to introduce actual letter sounds and tack them on, and we can start to connect them then because the kids are ready. I often will start my school year with a quick assessment of just what letters they already know and then get going right away on teaching my letter sounds because they those remembering those symbols and connecting them to print is a huge and can, sorry of connecting them to their sounds is a huge piece that takes for some kids a really long time and there, and there's no harm in looking at a symbol and naming it. It's not different from looking at a car and naming it or looking at a chair and naming it as a chair. So it's just one more thing that we're asking them to, to learn a name for. And in our case, we're learning the sound first because that's what we would use to read and spell. Oh, oh got that. Okay. So when I start to teach letter sounds in kindergarten. I am really careful about the sounds and letters that I choose. And I'm really careful about making sure that I introduce them in a way that really makes them 
stick in their minds as well as I can. And then we practice, practice, practice to make sure that we can use them in a lot of contexts. I really make an effort to make sure that my kids can hear the sound. They can discriminate it when they're hearing words, they can pull it out and recognize that sound as a sound that's different from other sounds. I really make sure that I've taught them to print the letter correctly. And I really make sure that they recognize what that letter looks like when they see it and that it's different from all the other little black squiggles that show up on a page when they're reading. So it's important, I think, to really get in the right mindset to be learning a letter sound. So we have this very special time in our day that starts early in the year when I tell my kids they're really, really lucky because I'm going to teach them a secret code. It's amazing. They can't get enough of it and they are hungry for it because kindergarten kids love secret codes. It's amazing. It's fun and exciting. And then sort of build them up and I tell them that this secret code is the secret code that all readers and spellers in English already know. And I'm going to teach it to them. I'm going to help them find out this secret code. They're going to unlock it and start to learn to use it. And I always say, learning a secret code is not easy. There are a lot of pieces. There's a lot of work involved. But wow, is it ever going to be worth it when you've got it. So let's get started right away. And the, the kids sort of feed on that excitement and their energy is contagious and so one or two who already are reading a bit or have figured out that what we're really talking about is letters kind of feed that to everybody else and it's and it's quite it's quite an exciting time in our class then we over time drop the word secret keep the word code and what we're really talking about is the code of the English language the letters and the sounds and the way words go together so that we can read them and spell with them so as I'm prepping my kids I'm also getting ready to go and getting ready to teach. And what I'd like to start with tonight with you is that sort of beginning, how I introduce a letter sound and get my kids ready to start to use those so that they can connect all the sound work they've been doing with phonological awareness to print and be able to start to put those pieces together. For some kids, that putting the pieces together process is really quick. And for other kids, it's a long haul. And so it's important, I think, to start early and to be fairly consistent so that we give kids enough of uh, enough opportunities to practice and enough of an exposure to be able to use those bits and feel confident and strong with them. So if we were doing our very, very first day of code instruction, usually the day after I introduce the idea of a secret code because I want the buzz to grow a little bit before I start to teach. And then the next day, come on over, everybody come and sit down and we'll get ready to get all my kids and they're all wide-eyed and ready to get going and then I'll say okay close your eyes and they all close their eyes and I say okay say these words say the word in and they say in and I say say the word itchy and they say itchy and I say the, say the word interesting and they say interesting and I say say the word if and they say if and so they've repeated those sounds and then I'll say oh my gosh what sound was the same in all of those words in my mind, I know that beginning sounds are easier for them to hear. So I've already chosen my words so that we're listening for beginning sounds. Later in the year, when I know they're hearing ending sounds and middle sounds, I might throw some sounds, that same sound somewhere else in the word just to see how that goes. But at the beginning, I want as many kids as possible to be able to tune in for that sound and recognize that that's the one that's the same. I've never been disappointed. I've never had an entire classroom full of kids not know what sound was the same. Sometimes some kids don't know, but somebody's got it. And that, that's really all I'm banking on. And as long as I've got one, they can say, oh, I heard I in all those words. Then I can say, you got it. That's right. You did hear that sound. And that's the sound of the letter I. And then I can show them. I'm just getting out. Oh, sorry. That's the wrong one. This one. Just getting out a little yellow card. So this little yellow card has a letter I printed on it, it's nice and clear. And that's the way that I will show my kids what the letter I looks like. And I'll say, you heard the sound of the letter I and it said, eh, that's right. See how my mouth has to smile a tiny bit when I say, eh, try that. Make your mouth smile like that when you say, eh. It's hard, isn't it? To say just a vowel sound all by itself. 
that can be tricky. It doesn't sound like a word. It just sounds like one little sound. So for us to practice this sound and all the other yellow vowel sounds we're going to learn first, we're going to say a little rhythm. Listen to this. It, chi, it, chi, it, it, it. And we practice it. I'll say, oh, now you try it. Let's pat it on our knees. It, chi, it, chi, it. Eh, eh. Whenever you see this card with this little letter I on it, you can say that same little rhythm over and over and it will help you remember that this letter I says eh, eh, eh. It says that sound. Let's practice again. If I hide it behind my back, when it pops out, make sure you say that sound and then we might do it a few times. I might switch hands back there and try it that way. And it's fun. They think it's hilarious. They're right in for the chanting. It's a great way to get started. And at the end of that lesson, I can put that one away and be pretty confident that they'll still remember it tomorrow. So I've taught them to hear that sound when I gave them those words. I taught them what their mouth needs to do to make those sounds. I'm not a speech language pathologist. It's just a good approximation of what their mouth needs to do. They've done a little smile. They've noticed sometimes children who have struggles with their speech and language might need to sit in front of a mirror or might need a little extra time to sit with me and really look at what my mouth is doing and what their mouth is doing and look in the mirror. But I just give them a, a good understanding of what's going on with their mouth so that they can make that sound. With vowel sounds, we often will put our hand on our throat and feel that our vocal cords are vibrating because that's an interesting thing to notice. And that when we're saying vowel sounds, those sounds are coming straight out and nothing is stopping them or blocking them and we're using our voice for vowels so that's an interesting little piece of information for them. I tell my kiddos this is a vowel. Sometimes they will call it a bowel for a long time and that's weak phonological skills that I keep in mind but they they do finally catch on and they will start to use vowel but what a great word for them to know and a great way for them to be able to refer to their language and be able to talk about what letters they know. So once I've taught them that chant, and I've taught them to pronounce the sound properly and to hear that sound properly, I also want to teach them to print that letter so that they can use it. Just pull a marker out. And I often will teach this one because it's the very first letter I teach. I want to be sure that I'm being very, very clear about this idea, this symbol, and that it's very, very special. And I'll say, oh my gosh, isn't it funny? This little letter I says, eh, eh, eh. And it's like a little short person standing there. And oh my gosh, that little dot is not touching the top of that little short person yet. It's just above them. But can you imagine if a mosquito was buzzing around your head and it bit you? It sure would make you feel itchy. And that might help you remember that that one says itchy, itchy, eh, eh, eh. And we can pretend, and for a while we will, when I'm prompting them to print that letter, we can pretend that we're drawing a little tiny person and putting a mosquito above their head. It's a nice little mental hook. It just helps them remember the way we print it, the way the sound sounds for us when we're using that chant. It connects those bits together and it gets them kind of fired up and ready. So once I've taught that one, that would be the end for that day. And the next day, we would teach a new piece of code that we can use in tandem, do some blending possibly, but also start to know more than one letter. If you're interested, I'm sure you are, the other vowel chants that we use in our class and I think are quite effective for learning these short vowel sounds, for the short A, we say a, pull, a, pull, a, 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 itchy is itchy. For the short E, we say eddy, eddy, eh, eh, eh. For the short O, Oscar, Oscar, ah, ah, ah. And for the short U, udder, udder, ah, ah, ah. For that one, I like to draw this awkward looking cow and show them that an udder is just like a letter U hanging down under the cow, which they think is hilarious. If udder is uncomfortable, it's fine to use upper, upper, up. Uh, uh. The interesting thing with all of these keywords and all of these chants is that when we split that sound off the beginning, we hear a nice, clean sound of the vowel that doesn't have any other sound attached to it. If you can imagine the word apple and the word ant, 
that N sound in the ant n, is so close to the A that it's actually impossible to really cut it all the way off. So ant would be a poorer option than apple when we're practicing that sound because we really want to hear that sound in its all by itself glory to make sure that we really can hear it and, and use it effectively. So once I pulled out my very first code card, I tuck this one away. This is the very first piece of code in a whole bunch of pieces of code that our kids are going to learn. And it's, it's exciting for them. And sometimes I'll let kids take cards home. Other times I keep them at school. I can make that decision as I go. And I often wouldn't send a single card home. I typically would wait until I've got a few more cards that they already know so that I make sure that my kids are going home and able, able to use them and able to practice them at home before I would send them. But I have sent them home in the past with, with many kids. Okay, so once we've had a good introduction to our new piece of code for today, then I will say, let's play a funny game or I'm gonna need some help. And then on my whiteboard, I might draw a picture that would help us practice that sound and practice recognizing this exact letter in a mix of other letters. Often at the beginning of the year, we call this alphabet soup. And so I'll draw poorly a soup pot and then I'll have a but can you see it yes I think so then I'll have some letters and some non letters and some wiggles and things and our kids job is to look carefully all over that soup pot and find the ones that exactly match the letter I. Of course, there are going to be slight variations in the way I would print with a marker. Sometimes I'll also show children a variation on the way the letter A might be printed or the way a letter U might be printed, just so that they're aware that different shapes of A's are still the same. But at the beginning, I really want to be sure that they can find this exact piece. So I might choose children to come up and make a circle around the itchy, itchy, it, 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 that they find that is exactly like mine. And if they come up and they start to move their marker toward something that's not the one that we're looking for, I'll say, oh, look really carefully. That one looks a lot like itchy, but it's upside down. It's not itchy anymore when it's upside down. So keep it upright like this and look for the one that has the dot at the top, like a mosquito up there. Can you find one? Have a close look look again and really give them lots of support and lots of encouragement and time to figure it out because it is tricky. Lots of little people have never ever tuned their eyes in in this way before to look for something so specific when they're looking at print. They maybe are great at finding ladybugs or they maybe are great at picking out the exact piece of Lego they need, but this is different. So I'll have them come and circle and then we put this guy away. Tomorrow, the next school day, we would take another look and add a new piece of code. Often as they're leaving the carpet, I might give them a chance to come and practice printing that letter. Often they will have a whiteboard on their knees. Once we've got a few letters under our belts, we often will keep a whiteboard ready or a chalkboard ready so that we can practice as we go. At the beginning, it's a little tricky. I know um, a lot of schools and a lot of programs would would maybe prefer to start with a short A sound, that apple, apple, ah, ah, ah. I used to do that too. And then I discovered that some children really struggled to print that little lowercase a, it's tricky. And so I switched over to starting with a short I because even a child who hasn't got much fine motor control and needs to fist a marker still can still be successful making that first go at that short I. And then by the time I've taught the letter C, and then I introduce the letter A, we can actually use that magic C shape to help us build on and write that short A sound. So that's our, that's our code. And I keep cracking away at that as frequently as I can, and also making sure that I'm not leaving kids behind. And I, and I just keep going. I add one new piece. I try to aim for three or four sounds every week. And I 
just try to keep adding them on to make sure that my kids are learning their letter sounds. For some kids, that learning is really fast. For other kids, it's a lot slower. It's important to find a nice spot where you're able to make sure that the kids who are moving along can keep moving along, but also supporting those little ones who are not learning as quickly and really recognizing that those are our kids who may find learning to read difficult. We're, we're talking in general in kindergarten about kids who are not necessarily reading at all yet, but we want to provide a really good strong foundation. And so using those phonological awareness tasks and using getting down into those phonemes through our oral and auditory play and also introducing our code one piece at a time and being really systematic about the way that we're introducing them so that we're making sure that they know how to recognize that letter in print, they recognize the sound that it says, they are able to print the letter top down if we can, top down is helpful, <laughs> right off the hop when we teach them to print straight away. It's, it's, a nice, it's a nice way to tie all those bits together. And so it's important, I think, to think about all those pieces. Can they, can they recognize it? Can they hear it? Can they pronounce the sound well? And then can they use that sound? It's also important to note that when we're working on that little letter I in an alphabet soup, it's quite easy. But when you start to think about B's and D's and P's and Q's that are very, very similarly shaped, this kind of task becomes a whole lot more difficult. And as I've taught more letters, I can start to have other letters mixed into the soup as well. So it's not just a bunch of random symbols, it's also other letters mixed in so that they're really trying to pull apart and look for the exact one. Once we're starting, to have some other text around in our classroom where I might have a sentence on my board or I might have a few words on my board, then we might start to circle that new sound that we're working on within the mix of letters and sounds that are there. So that, that gets tricky for a lot of kids. Um, do we, how much time, Jan, have we got? Um, Enough to do one more sound or, okay. All right, so if sure, right. I think we should, uh, Emily, yes. yeah, yeah, keep going or stop. Yes, keep, keep going. Sorry. Okay, no, that's okay. So once I've taught that short I, then I start to add a new sound. So I choose sounds at the beginning that we can stretch out and really hear. So once I start the next day, I would begin, I'll just erase my soup pot so we're ready to go. And I'll have the kids, same thing, close their eyes, listen in, and we'll say, I'll say, say the word soup. Say the word salad. Say the word summer. Say the word Samantha. And we'll start to, again, raise your hand if you can hear a sound that was the same in all of those words. And they already by then are kind of tuning in and they, they'll say, oh, I heard s in all those words. And I'll say, great, that's amazing. Good for you. Here's what that letter looks like. It's the letter S. So now, of course, we have two pieces of code. It's got a snake at the top, upside down. We'll go that way. I don't know. So now we have two pieces of code that our kids have been exposed to, and we'll do the same thing again. So once we've talked about hearing that sound in those little words, then I'll say, what is your mouth doing when you're saying the sound s? And they'll start to notice what their tongue feels like or what their teeth feel like or what their lips are doing. And then it's important to also add, is your voice working when you're saying that sound? Try it. S Does it vibrate like it did when we said I? It doesn't, amazing. So that sound doesn't need our voice. We just say s with our tongue and our teeth this time. That's very interesting. I often will say, gosh, doesn't this one look just like a snake? And they, of course, think it, it does look just exactly like a snake and isn't that interesting. It's a great time to teach with a uh, sky grass ground card. Oh, that's yucky. Um, which is just a printing card that I've been using at school um, for the last couple of years. And I make them myself, but I'm sure they're readily available. Um, sort of based on giving kids a good anchor for being able to print their letter sounds. So the top part is colored in blue. The middle part is green. The bottom bit is 
brown. So it's the sky and the grass and the ground and snakes are always in the grass, of course, they can't fly. So when we try to print that letter S, let's try to stick it right in the grass. When we're working at the carpet with the whole class or with a bigger group, we often wouldn't use these little cards because they're a little fiddly. But when I'm working with a smaller group, it's a great way for me to really start to target their printing practice a little more. So I'll tell the kids, start your marker at the top and make it go around and around and stop. And we'll practice lots. They'll practice lots on their whiteboards and then we'll keep on going. Isn't that interesting? That's the way you would print that sound. Let's play alphabet soup again or let's play some other game. Same kind of idea though, where there are lots of S's to look for, even if it's in a morning message or a text or a cover of a book that we've been looking at already at school, they can start to pinpoint those S's and say, goodness, look at how they look just like a snake. Every time we see them, it might even be funny once to draw a little tongue on the snake to help us remember, but that's not part of the letter. So it's important to not make that the thing that we do every time. Once we've got a few letter sounds, we can start to put the sounds together. So typically I wouldn't really start working on blending until I had three or four sounds, but it's, it's a thing that we can do with our cards. We can put one card in front and one card behind and start to teach kids to put those sounds together, which is really what we are doing when we're reading. Any time after this, when we're working on writing at school or when we're working on other tasks and we come to that I sound or we come to that s sound, I often will hand off the pencil or the pen that I'm using and have kids start to join me in printing those letters that they've already been taught and using them when they're reading. We like to play a fun game with these two when we just have two and I'll tuck them both behind my back and I'll say, okay, get ready. I'm going to try to trick you, but try not to get tricked. And then I'll pop one pop the same one, pop the other one, switch back and forth, switch them behind my back. So when they see the right hand coming, they think it's going to be one, but then it's the other. And I want them to say that sound every time they see it. So what sound does this one say? It, G, it, G, it, eh, eh. What about this one? S and we want to keep reviewing and practicing them. And the goal is really to make it as fast, as fast, as fast can be so that they're recognizing those letters really, really quickly so that we can start to use them. I think that's pretty well all I had to teach tonight. And so if we wanted to start to maybe do some question and answer stuff, we could, is that helpful? Is that that's good? just awesome, Emily. Thank you, uh, mm -hmm. thanks so much. I think that just gives us a great uh, insight into the actual things happening in your classroom, <laughs> the, the sequence that you're working through and uh, yeah, fantastic. So let's jump to some questions that are uh, coming in here. Great, thanks, Emily. So we have a we have a number of questions for you. Okay. I know that we're going to have time for all of them, so I apologize uh, if we don't get to your question. Uh, we'll certainly try to cover that information in the next webinar. We'll give Emily all of the questions. Um, starting off, somebody asked uh, the technique you're using. Are you yeah. using an Orton Gillingham technique, or is this a technique that you've created on your own, or what would you call what you're doing? Oh, um, so. What I'm doing is is what I learned from what the reading clinic was doing. And I, my understanding is that the reading clinic is sort of Orton Gillingham heavy, but not completely Orton Gillingham. There's some, there's some Barton, there's some other bits and lots that they've worked on on their own. So sort of taken lots of programs and tucked in. Yep. Uh, right, and so the and this whole thing sort of turns into this structured literacy approach that it's multi-sensory, it's engaging, and it's very systematic and structured. So what we're what we're teaching there there is a plan, and there's there's a nice step-by-step -step sequence there. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thank you. Another question that we had is about the resources that you're using. Um, one listener wanted to know if you're using a specific program or if there are resources that you would suggest for people to um, invest in for their kindergarten classrooms. Okay, so um, a lot of what I use at school at the beginning especially is, is things that I make on my own. So I often will write little words and little phrases. So because I know exactly what code I've taught so far in those earliest days, there are only so many letters that they know. And so any kind of text that we might try to pull in um, sort of a, a program or books that are that are readily available don't necessarily follow exactly the same sounds that I use. We really like the primary phonics um, series at school. Um, 
especially the, the little workbook pages because we can chop those down. They're often sectioned into smaller pieces. So I don't have to have kids doing whole pages of any kind of work, but they really, really help them to put those pieces together because there might be a picture, but they're also really working on spelling their, their sounds, but they need to know a fair number of sounds really before they can really take off on those. That was Enough. my favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Another um, common question that we got from a number of people is about the order in which you uh, introduce the letters. Yes. If you talk about the sequence that you use. Sure. So um, there's there's a lot more about scope and sequence in webinar number two, um, but but certainly I have sort of played with a scope and sequence over a number of years because I find something that works really well or that doesn't work as well. Like when I moved my short A a little later and put my I first, that was, that was because in my classroom, kids were not being successful right off the hop because I was asking them to print a letter that was actually difficult for their little hands and their motor skills to be able to print. So I is a lovely one because it's so nice and easy to print. S is quite easy because it's nice and smooth. They might get it backwards, but it's easy enough to say, oh, start over here and make it come around that way and now make it go this way. And we can act that, that out for a long time. I try then to use quite a few letters at the beginning that are fairly easy to print that look different from each other and that sound different from each other. And I'm fairly heavy at the beginning with those ones that we can stretch out and really stretch that sound, the continuance sound so that we can really hear the sound for a nice long time if we need to. I've played around with my with my scope and sequence and I continue to, to do that. But I think the kicker really is that we must teach all the sounds and we must keep going. So once, once we've taught all 26, we can also do digraphs. So my kindergarten kids know C H S H T H W H P H. We know some vowel teams. So we just sort of keep going as long as we have time and they're not maxing out. And so when they when they really start to stumble, then I'll ease off and introduce new sounds and the time to practice and build skills with the sounds that they quite master and then add one new piece, build them up again, and then keep going. At the beginning they seem to need a little bit of time, but not a lot of time because individual sounds that we're only using as individual sounds are, are fairly easy to use. Later on, we have to sort of ease off and slow down a bit because there is there does come a time when all those long vowel patterns are really overwhelming. I like to leave my long vowels a long time before I start to use them and really, really focus on those short vowels, knowing that for most of our kids, three sounds is about as many sounds as they could really work on using for reading and spelling anyway. And so that lets me stay in those short vowels for a really long time. And they're slippery little things. <laughs> Once we know our long vowel sounds, the short vowels kind of get a little a little shaky. And it's, it's nice to really make sure that I've got a really good solid grasp of our short vowels before we move on. Great. Um, another uh, good question is, in, in most kindergarten classes, we know that we have a blend of JK and SK students. Um, so for some of the kids, obviously, this is going to be the first exposure they've had, but then for the SKs that you had the year before, yeah. how are you extending your lessons so that you're engaging everyone? So we've been using um, exactly, exactly that. So I have students now who were in my class last year who have a great deal of code that they already have under their belts and that they can use really, really effectively. So this year and many years, I end up splitting my whole group into two smaller groups. Some of my juniors are ready to go right away or my year one students. And, and so they often can catch up and then keep up with those bigger guys right away. Others have never, never looked at letters before and really need every introduction to be the same. Some of my kids who were in my class last year didn't get a full grasp on them when they were in their first year in kindergarten. And so they often really benefit from hearing those introductions again as though they have never been taught them before. That way it doesn't feel like, it doesn't even feel sort of remediating kind of to those kids because it's just like they're hearing them for the first time. The little, little ones, sometimes they're still three for months when they start kindergarten. And it's important to recognize that for those little tinies, there are lots of other big things that their little brains need to need to learn. And perhaps learning letters right away when they're still three might, might be beyond what they're really ready for. So it's important to kind of recognize that some of my kids are already six now and some of them have barely turned four and to recognize that within that range, I've got 
a few different maybe abilities and groups. So often now, most of my kids who come for one group are kids who had exposure to code last year. And then I do a second time, a second group for my kids who are just being exposed for the first time or who need to hear it again for the first time. Great. Um, so we have so many questions. Do you have a few more minutes Emily, that you can yep, stay on? Go ahead. Is that okay, Jill, if we just keep yeah, going? I think we should keep going. I think yeah. just right. cutting in and I'd love to get to some of them. Um, okay, so we have another person who's asked about um, how much you pack into one lesson, essentially. So do you hear, pronounce, recognize, print, and apply all at the same time within one lesson? That, that's the goal. And in addition, in addition to that, I try to review what we already know from before. So we've had a quick look, we've done a little bit of work with the stuff that we already knew, and then I start to teach something new so that all those old bits that we already knew don't fall away. They stay in what we already know, and then we add one new piece to the mix. For sure, some kids, some, some years, lots of kids are not ready to sit for a long time. In my heart of hearts, at the beginning of the year, I'm aiming for five or six minutes of code time. And by this point in the year, if a lot of my kids will stay for 12 or 15 minutes and, and keep right on going. And as they know more code, there's more that they're, they're able to do. And so they feel like they can stick it out a little longer. And often we'll play our, our latest funny game is when we're trying to write a word and we'll sound out the sounds and hear the sounds and then start to print them. And I'll, They'll get the word, say they wrote the word sun, and then I'll say, oh, I didn't mean sun, I meant bun, and they'll wipe off and fix. And I can keep them going even a little longer once they've kind of started to have had enough, but I can push them a little further and get them to do a few more words, and they think it's hysterical that I keep making mistakes and they keep having to fix whatever they wrote, but really, it's great practice, and they're buying in. So, mm hmm that's great. Um, another a number of people have asked about uppercase letters. Um, and are you introducing uppercase and lowercase at the same time? Or, or how are you handling that? So I introduce lowercase letters first and only for a good long time. A lot of children come to kindergarten already knowing many uppercase letters. Typically when they learn to print their names before they come to school, there are a lot of uppercase letters or a random mix of uppers and lowers. And uppers, I think, don't show up as frequently when we read. And also, are quite a lot easier for many kids to print. And so for kids who are really struggling with their uh, pen or pencil control, I might move toward uppercase letters, but they're, they're never my first choice because really for teaching our kids how to read, they, they need those lowercases first. Certainly I show them what an uppercase letter looks like, but often those, those letters come up as, as we work along. And so when it's somebody's name starts like that, we'll notice that, oh, look at this lowercase z that we're learning right now. But oh, look at Zoe, her name starts like that. And look what the uppercase looks like too, or the months of the year. Like some of those, some of those features are around in my room, the kids' names or my name or other words that are around close to us. And so that we can, we can start to use those and tack them on after. But my initial go is really about the letter sound and the lowercase letter. And then I tuck the other ones in later. That's great. Um, another, we had a, a few other questions about using this technique with English language learners. Mm -hmm. So do you have much experience with that? Um, I have several English language learners in my class. Um, it's that they're quite interesting and fun because this is actually a really great way for them to really hear the sounds and learn to pronounce them well. Um, it can be tricky and it can be a bit of a leap, but it also seems to be such small little chunks that they they will join in sooner than you might think because the pieces are small and, and they can actually attach a sound to a symbol and then be able to use that and be able to produce the sound that we're, that we're looking for in a way that often they, they may not be able to do when they're trying to express ideas that are inside their heads. So it's, it's a way for them to connect and to join in with us on the carpet much, much sooner in, in many ways than, than when we're talking about a book that we've read aloud or we're talking about something else that we're wanting to do in our classroom where much of that language is just flowing over our little ones. This, this is a time when they know how to produce the sound that, that is expected. And so they can be quite successful really early on with this too. And it's a great way for us to zero in and help them put those pieces together. And often our little English language learner kids become great little readers in English, even when their pronunciation and vocabulary is still fairly limited, they, they start to be able to be quite successful. 
That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we can probably wrap it up there. Okay. Jill, did you have any? I have one more question. Yes. You, Jill has a question. Fantastic. Emily, you've, you have taught for four, a number of years before you started using this approach mm -hmm. and, and working with code. Uh, can you speak to the results you're seeing in the reading abilities of these kids as they leave kindergarten and their success in, K, in, uh, sorry, in grade one? Yeah, absolutely. So what, what we're seeing is really, really exciting and, and interesting because our kiddos are leaving us now with a really firm grasp on how the sounds go together. Generally speaking, my kids are ready to go ahead and at least be confident little readers of CVC words or consonant vowel consonant with short vowel sounds in their middles. Some of my kids have learned lots and lots of long vowel patterns as well. But even if, even if all they've really got are those short vowels and a bunch of consonant sounds or all the consonant sounds and maybe a few digraphs, they can, they can read a lot of words and they sure feel like they know how to read. And because most of the text that I'm giving them as we progress doesn't have a picture attached, they are forced to learn to decode those words sound by sound, letter by letter, and really, really work on them. I often will tell kids straight up, this part of learning to read is called effortful decoding. That means it takes a lot of work, but you're gonna get there. And as we decode these words over and over again, we start to store them in a different part of our brain that's more of a long-term storage. So those words will start to be really easy for you to read more and more quickly, the more you read and the more you practice. And it, it gives kids a sense that, okay, this is worth it. I'll dig in because this part is hard for everybody. This is, this is the part that, and for some kids that effortful decoding goes on for a long, long, long time. And for others, you almost don't see it happen. But, but to know that every brain goes through that, that phase of learning to read is really, really, I think, comforting information. And so when they're feeling frustrated, it's, it's great to be able to say, you're just in a certain phase of learning how to read and you're going to take off. My guys, even the ones who are not yet reading when they go to grade one, and sometimes it happens that they, they know a lot of sounds, but they haven't quite put the pieces all together. Those kids still have a great sense of the way reading works. They know what they're supposed to do. They know how to put their finger under the first sound and then move across the word or cover up the end of the word and put those bits together to help them figure out the word. And they have lots of strategies tucked in and they have lots of knowledge about spelling patterns and about the way our letter system works so that they feel like they can go ahead and be successful. And if they're not quite reading or they're not quite spelling independently, they've got a really great foundation and they're ready to learn. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. so it's fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you again, Emily, for um, you're very welcome. Uh, lively and uh, <laughs> very, uh, you know, very informative. Great, I'm so glad. Very helpful yeah. for all thank of us.